I've entitled the message this morning, the next three weeks we'll be going through what I'm calling us in this short series, Christmas in the Psalms. And this morning we're going to look at the 22nd Psalm and see how Jesus came to this earth, as we just read a few moments ago from Isaiah chapter 53, to endure suffering on our behalf, this season of suffering. The next a uh, couple of weeks after this, we'll look next week on Christmas Eve Day at Psalm 110, and that message will be entitled, A Christmas Fit for a King. And then the last day, on New Year's Eve Day, we'll look at Psalm 118 in a message that I'm, in, I'm calling a return policy, and really focusing on the, the thankfulness and gratitude we should have for the Savior who is returning back to earth. But as we think through these texts, as we think through today's text, particularly in Psalm 22, it is a lament psalm. It is a reminder to us that when we go through these times of loss, when we go through these times of deprivation and suffering, I know that even now as I look across the congregation, there are some of you who have things that are joyful, there was reasons for some of you as parents or grandparents, as you saw your children up here on the platform this morning, just to feel the warmth, the, the, the gratitude, the sense of thankfulness that God gives to you with these new lives, the new potential uh, that they have as you see them developing and growing, what they've been able to retain, the concepts that they have in their minds and in their hearts. But for others, that can actually be somewhat of a painful situation. Maybe it's a reminder of family that's estranged or people in your lives who have walked away from the faith, the whole deconstruction thing that we hear people talking about these days where people are evaluating and analyzing and figuring out that they don't really believe in these things and they don't really want to teach their children these things, these truths about God. And that, that brings pain, that brings disappointment, that brings heartache. Some of you are going through health challenges and difficulties on those fronts, and you know the burden, the weight that you would like to be around family. You would like to be sharing these experiences, but these other things cause obstacles. These other things cause hindrance. They cause you to have to withdraw from family so that you don't expose yourself or expose them, or you just don't have the energy and the vitality as you're going through your treatments. You don't have the memory some of you. You don't have the physical strength and capabilities, and it's just, it's such a burden, it's such an effort just to have to go forward with some of these things in this time of year. It can be overwhelming. Some of you are experiencing marital difficulty and discord and the pain and the disappointment and having to make adjustments because I'm going to be spending Christmas here, and he's going to be spending Christmas here, and the kids are torn back and forth, and it's hard. It's difficult. Christian, how do we deal with that? How do we help others walk through that kind of heartache and turmoil and pain? This is where we look to the Savior who has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We look to Psalm 22. Again, I've mentioned it's a psalm of lament. It's a psalm of, of mourning. It carries weight. In fact, it's the psalm that probably is best known because it is the psalm from which our Lord quoted on the cross as He hung there in anguish and suffering. It is a lament psalm, and the psalms are those places where we can look when we feel the weight of a situation. They give us voice and cause for rejoicing. We have times of gratitude and thankfulness. We have times where the Psalms help give voice to the stability that we have, the sense of happiness and joy that we express. But it's interesting as you look at the Psalms that actually the biggest category of all the different kinds of Psalms that are in the 150 Psalms that are contained in the Psalter almost one-third of the psalms that are contained there are discouraging, lament, mourning kinds of psalms. They are talking about the pain and the anguish and the suffering we go to. And God, where are you? That's how this psalm opens up. And we'll see that in just a moment. But it's psalms of lament should be, as one author, Mark Vrogop, has said, a prayer in pain 
that leads to trust. If you want to read more, if you're, if you're moved after hearing us talk about this in a very brief way, I would actually recommend to you the, the book that's on the screen. Mark Rogop is a pastor. He spoke at our national conference for the GRBC a couple of years ago, and he's written a book called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. I would very much commend that to you, whether you personally are going through time of suffering or you want a resource to be able to give to somebody who's going through a difficulty or a trial, to how to utilize the mechanisms that God has given us in His Word when we go through sorrow, when we go through pain. But he has said that a lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. A prayer in pain that leads to trust. Lament psalms, as we see them, can be broken down into things that tell us about mourning. That is, we're expressing our sorrow. We express complaints. And you'll see that as David writes this Psalm 22 and goes through and expresses what he's going through. And God, this isn't fair. This just doesn't seem right. I don't know where you are. He's asking questions. And sometimes, again, we think that asking God why, it feels just wrong. Who are we to ask God? But God has told us in His Word that that's what He wants us to do. When Peter says we cast all our cares on Him because He cares for us, he's not just saying, well, put the best spin on the situation, be happy all the time. He's saying you have these feelings. Don't keep them bottled up. Give them to the Lord. And that's what these psalms are helping us do. In the times of suffering, we ask our questions. We give our cares and complaints to God, but we don't remain there. In the end, we look to Him for the resolution. We find our hope in Christ. We find our hope in our God. Keep that in mind as we read through the 22nd Psalm. I'm going to read the entire chapter here if you want to follow along as I read. The words will be here on the screen uh, as well as uh, in your Bible in front of you. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. To the choir master, according to the Doe of the Dawn, which most interpreters think was probably some kind of a musical setting, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from my womb. You, took, you made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion." You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. 
all you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation that they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. That he, that he has done it. This is the word of God inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, then on its pages we might meet the living Christ. God had his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. As we've mentioned, this psalm is written by David. It is a psalm of David, and so it would have had a particular understanding to the immediate audience in the immediate context but it is also uniquely framed in the New Testament as linked to our Lord and Savior. It is is seen as a prophecy of His crucifixion. It is quoted no less than 11 times in the New Testament, predominantly in the description as Christ hung on the cross and linked with Him saying these things and fulfilling prophecies that were contained here. For example, in Mark 15, 29, you see the reference to the wagging heads. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who will destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Matthew 27, 46, he quotes verse 1 where he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you can go through and see other some references if you want to look up Mark 15, 29, Mark 27, 43, Mark, uh, or John 20, 19, 24. I'll read that one. He says, So they said one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the Scripture from Psalm 22, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But it is quoted one other time outside of the Gospels, linked again to a fulfillment of prophecy about the Lord Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, the author of Hebrews quotes Psalm 22 and says, I will tell your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your prayer, your praise. It is not left to just Christ's suffering on our behalf, but the joy of the rejoicing, the sense of triumph that we would have because of Christ's suffering on our behalf. That fulfillment of prophecy is so important, so vital for us who go through suffering. But it is also instructive for us to read the whole psalm and remember that just as Christ would suffer and articulate His sufferings and cry out, to God, a righteous man who had done no wrong, who had done nothing to deserve the suffering that he endured, called to God for relief and found hope into your hands, not quoted from this, but certainly in spirit with it, into your hands I commend my spirit. You have made your presence known to me. I do have hope. I find that Father in you. And this is where we can look in our times of need and suffering. The text helps us understand how in our own times of pain and heartache, if you're using the outline to follow along on the back of your bulletin, 
is that God supports the suffering. God supports those of us who are going through times of difficulty, the ones who are going through chemotherapy and having no energy, the ones who are going through the marital difficulty, the ones who are going separation, the ones who have no rest, it seems like, physically, it's just on and on. You're feeling drained. You're going through pain. You're going through trial. You're going through heartache. Christian, look to God and give out your cries to Him because He is paying attention. He tells us here to cry out to Him. He models it for us says to air your complaints in the first two verses my god why have you forsaken me why are you so far away from me give voice to your complaint don't feel like it's somehow sacrilegious somehow some kind of a lack of faith we came out of a generation it seems like where that was the common thought every day with jesus is sweeter than the day before i'm so happy and here's the reason why and it's, there's an appropriate time to rejoice. I'm not trying to downgrade at that at all. But you don't have to feel guilty, Christian, for not always experiencing that level of high. Not always being up. Jesus is the one who is acquainted with our griefs. He is described in that text that we read as a man of sorrows. He's one who knows what you're going through. Take your complaints to Him. Tell Him about your pain. You look in verse 12 of our text where He describes this, that I'm surrounded by these foes. They're predatory upon me. It feels like they're all against me. God, I don't know where to turn. The whole world just seems like it's there. I'm overwhelmed by these circumstances. He describes his physical condition in verse 14. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melted within my breast. My strength is dried up. And you might be sitting there. Maybe you're not even here in the building this morning. You're watching this on a stream or you're watching this later on in a way. But know that He is sympathetic. He will give you strength. Let Him hear about your pain and call out to Him for deliverance as the psalmist does here. David says in verse 19, Lord, do not be far off. You are my help. Come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul. And friend, God may not always do that. He may be like Paul says in 2 Corinthians, giving you an answer that my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is going to be made perfect in your times of weakness. There is a time where you must find the joy even as you bear the pain. But don't hesitate to talk to God about it. That is what prayer is is for that is what he wants you to remember that in the times of difficulty he is paying attention and he will provide you with strength depend on him there is going to be a process and that's the next line on your outline you're using this to follow along he is paying attention and he has promised to help you endure depend on him isaiah tells us in isaiah 40:31 Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We like the second part of that verse. but The first part is hard. Because it means that that gratification, that satisfaction, that salvation is not always going to be instantaneous. There is a time where we have to wait. There is a time where you have to call and know that He has heard, but He has not yet given the answer. He has not yet supplied the strength. Again, Jesus portrays that on the cross as He rides in grief and agony. We like to focus, and rightfully so, during this time of year, on the innocence 
of the baby in a manger. But even there, you look at what his parents had to go through. There was not an easy time to make the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, to be subjected to the inhumanity and the embarrassment, those horrible conditions, not even being able to be in a familiar place as she gave birth to her firstborn child, wrapping him in rags, lying him instead of on a clean place in a bed of hay, in a bed of things that animals were eating, and all the filth that goes with that. How much of an indignity, how horrific and uncomfortable and suffering it was. And Jesus was born in the middle of that. But It's a reminder to you, friend, that yes, there is a process, but God has promised to provide salvation. He has promised to provide strength. So listen to what it says in 1 Chronicles 16.11. Seek the Lord. Seek His strength. Seek His presence and do so continually. Even if it doesn't feel like it's getting through, that's the process, that's the mechanism that He's given to us in those times. Don't bottle it up. Don't pretend it doesn't exist. Don't go resentful at God or resentful of others. One of the bad things that we do with complaining is we will often indulge ourselves in complaining to anyone who will give a listening ear. Anyone else but God. We pour out and vent our frustrations, maybe on our caregivers, on people who are coming around and, and trying to, to be pleasant, trying to give us encouragement, and we'll just indulge with them. Or maybe these days we'll whip out our phones and express it on social media. However you do it, you're not giving it to God. You're not processing it the way He wants to. He says, cast your cares on me. I'm the one who cares for you. Now, Christian, you might have to help somebody else. That's what it means when Paul says in Galatians 6, we are to bear each other's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Part of what we do when we have somebody going through difficulty and they aren't looking the way they ought to, is we direct their pain, we direct it to somebody else as we pray. I hope that you take the time, if somebody's complaining, not just to, hey, you need to put a positive spin on it. That can be in a, a time of encouragement. Maybe the appropriate thing to do when somebody is telling you about all their aches and pains, all their heartache and difficulty, is to just take a moment and say, God, listen to my brother. Listen to my sister. Hear what they're going through. Understand and grieve with them. Go through a time of mourning. Because, as Jesus says, the ones who mourn will be comforted. That is a promise our Lord has given to us. So listen again to Habakkuk 3.19. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3, The Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. He has promised strength to those who ask. Friend, if you don't know Christ, know that the one place where you need strength more than any other is the hope of what happens after death. The reality of our suffering, the reality of what we endure in this life is because of the curse of sin. It is what has separated us from God. But when we look to Christ, the one who, as we read there in Isaiah 53, has borne our sorrows. He has carried our griefs. God laid our sin, our iniquities on Him. Because all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. We don't pray like we ought to. We don't give it like we ought to. We indulge in all these other things. God knows. God knows who we are and what we do. And yet, He still says, 
Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Look to Jesus, friend. Look to Jesus. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is important for your eternal soul, to have that confidence, to have that hope. But Christian, it's also a reminder to you that when you are going through the difficulty, when you are enduring the suffering, you call on Him and He will deliver you. He will give you relief. He will provide you comfort. So take comfort in the sufferings of Christ. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. What is he thanking God for? Because he is the Father of mercies. He is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, in all the difficulties that I endure, Paul says, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That is, he's letting me go through this time of difficulty right now. One of the reasons is not just to demonstrate the reality of who he is and the strength that he provides. He's letting me go through this difficulty so that I can bear that burden with somebody else, that I can remind them how he's delivered me from this time of suffering, and he can do the same for them. This is what God has for us. He is the God of comfort. He is the God who lets us endure these things. We just quoted just a few moments ago from 2 Corinthians where Paul says, my grace is sufficient for you. That's what he, the message he heard from God. How many times have others learned from that comfort, learned from that experience? Paul had to suffer to hear those words. Paul knew, and now we know, that God is sufficient. Give your complaints to Him. Go through that difficulty, but rely on the fact that God has suffered for you so that you could have relief, so that you could go through this. Cast your burden on Him, Psalm 55, 22. God will sustain you. He isn't going to let you be moved. He isn't going to take away your ultimate stability. There is the reality that we might waver in the wind, but the righteous are portrayed time and again, like in Psalm 1, as the one who is rooted in God's truth, the one who is anchored. We have that stability. And though we go through the difficulty, we remain firm in the rock of ages. We remain anchored to Him. Cast your burden on God and rejoice in His salvation. We do give our complaints to God, but it's an important thing to remember when we go through the suffering that we don't remain there. We don't get stuck in complaining. That's the model that we have in front of us in Psalm 22 as well. As much as He articulates His unhappiness the suffering that he goes through, the descriptions of the pain that he is enduring. He comes to the point in verses 19-21 that he calls out to God for deliverance and then what he's going to do once he has been delivered. Verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And then he reminds himself and others All the ends of the earth, verse 27, shall remember and turn to the Lord because God has delivered. Because God has made Himself manifest in your time of suffering and showed His capability and His strength to take you out. It is a move that we go from the time of suffering to the time of praise. This is a difficult season for some of you. Don't let it remain difficult. Find your hope. As Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. It is a process that we work through, 
but we don't remain in suffering. We, re- we move on to the hope that He supplies. Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, which includes that difficulty, which includes that diagnosis, which includes that loss. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We shouldn't just view it as a list, God, give me this, give me this, give me this. It should be more along the lines of what he says here in Psalm, 9, in Psalm 22. Deliver my soul from the sword. Save me from the mouth of the lion. I'm surrounded by these things. God, give me strength. Come to my aid. When we ask God for those things, Paul says in Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Remember, friend, that as we go through these times, He has an end goal in sight. All things do work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Jesus suffered so that we might have hope, so that we might find peace, find rest in Him. As you suffer, as you go through that time of difficulty, the point that I want you to remember from this text is that you are not alone. We've covered Psalm 22 this morning. And it is no mistake that in this altar, the cry of my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What comes next in the sequence? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For You are with me. Your rod and Your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever.